I think I think we're going to get started now. Hi, I'm Kathy Kelly, Executive Director of Family Caregiver Alliance, and I'd like to welcome everybody to um, our program today in conversation with Dr. Diane Meir, Palliative Care on the Front Lines of COVID-19. We appreciate Dr. Meir's time today to discuss how this pandemic has impacted medical decision making for those with serious illness, how families can improve communications with professionals during this time, and how COVID may be reshaping recommendations for palliative care practice. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge those who supported the efforts for this uh, presentation today. First, this is sponsored by the California Caregiver Resource Centers, 11 nonprofit centers that provide consistent core services to assess the needs of unpaid family caregivers caring for a relative friend or partner with Alzheimer's and related dementias, stroke, traumatic brain injuries, and other chronic conditions, resulting in a tailored package of services such as care planning, legal and financial consultation, respite, and interventions to reduce stress, depression, uh, and build capacity for care. Coincidentally this year, the CRC system has been redesigning service delivery to utilize multiple technology platforms to deliver services such as assessment, care consultation, and counseling with families via telehealth training, uh, peer support, and activity programs for caregivers as part of a three-year effort to transform service delivery supported by the California Department of Healthcare Services. The CRCs remain open as an essential service and are busier than ever during this time. FCA is proud to be a caregiver re the Caregiver Resource Center for the San Francisco Bay Area. I would also like to thank a local partner, the San Francisco Department of Disability and Aging Services for their support of this program and acknowledge the great work of the Center to Advance Palliative Care, or CAPSI as shorthanded, for their guidance on this program. And of course, I wanna thank the staff at FCA for all the behind the scenes work too. We designed this webinar to be a bit less formal and more conversational. We will begin with a brief overview by Dr. Mayer of her experiences at one of the busiest hospitals in New York City during the COVID-19 pandemic, which continues on, and then move to our conversation and open up for your questions during the last 15 minutes or so. If you wish to ask a question, please use the chat function on the panel located at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many of your questions as possible. All audience members, however, will be muted during this presentation. This program will be recorded or is being recorded. So if you thought you missed something or didn't write something down fast enough, it will be posted on FCA's YouTube channel. Uh, and now to our program. I would like to introduce Dr. Diane Mayer. Uh, she's the CEO of the Center to Advance Palliative Care, or CAPSI. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the work of CAPSI in just a moment, so I'm not going to talk uh, too much about it right now. Under her leadership, the number of palliative care programs in the U.S. in U.S. hospitals has more than tripled in the last 10 years. She's co-director of the Patty and Joy Baker National Palliative Care Center, professor of geriatrics and palliative medicine, Catherine Gaisman, Professor of Medical Ethics, and was a founder and director of the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute from 1997 to 2011, all at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. She's been named one of the 20 people who make healthcare better in the U.S. by Healthcare Leaders Media in 2010, and has been elected to the Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences in 2013. She's the recipient of numerous awards from the Gustav O. Lienart Award from the National Academy of Medicine, the HAA Herit Trust Award, as well as being a, a MacArthur, named a MacArthur Fellow, Foundation Fellowship in September of 2018. She also served as a health and policy, uh, uh, health and aging policy fellow in Washington, D.C., working on both the Senate's Health Committee and at the Department of Healthcare and Human Services. She has um, uh, written and uh, published over 200 peer review publications in, med in the medical literature, and her most recent book, Meeting the Needs of Older Adults with Serious Illness, Challenges and Opportunities in the Age of Reform, was published by Humana in, in 2014. For me personally, um, Dr. Mir has been an inspiration as a researcher, 
practitioner, mentor, and advocate for families and those needing palliative care. And I've been pleased to have the opportunity to work as an, uh, on advisory kidneys on, on several of her projects. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Diane Mayer. Diane? Thank you, Kathy. What a lovely introduction. And let me turn it back to you, my um, admiration, respect, and gratitude for the work you have done with the Family Caregiver Alliance, creating resources and really practical help for people all across the country. Um, and anything we can do to shine a light on your organization and the service it provides. Um, we'd, we'd like to help. I think one of the biggest problems is there are resources out there, but a lot of people just don't know about them. And so we want to help um, bring people to you and your resources because God knows there's a desperate need. So <clears throat> let me begin by thanking you also for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, I really appreciate the chance to speak with those of you on this webinar and, and actually to hear from you what you're experiencing, what you're seeing as the biggest challenges, um, what's going well, what's not going so well, um, that information would really help us uh, to develop new resources and tools. Kathy, can you hear me? I just saw a, a note yes. saying someone couldn't hear, but you can I, hear me. I can hear you, yes. Okay, good. All right. So this uh, very brief talk is titled Palliative Care on the Front Lines of COVID-19. Um, and if you could move to the next slide, please. So one of the biggest issues um, facing patients and their loved ones um, and the general public and doctors, nurses, social workers, and other healthcare professionals is how to communicate at a time when no one is face-to-face, -face, when um, pretty much all communication is occurring through telephone or tablet um, or some kind of screen or another. And um, these are the types of phrases or scripts that we've been disseminating around New York City and actually around the nation to help clinicians who are not trained in palliative care communication, most of us never got any training in how to do this, um, to reduce the anxiety of these, of these conversations and make them easier to initiate and easier to conduct. So for example, you might, if you are calling a family member or a patient, um, to begin mostly by asking questions more than talking. Um, we use the phrase, ask, tell, ask, begin by asking um, several questions, then share whatever information or news you have, and then ask another question. So here's an example of a clinician. In this case, I put my name in there, calling a family member about a patient who may either be in a facility or in a hospital and saying, the first thing to say when you call is this is not an emergency. Because the minute a family realizes they're getting a call from a nurse or a doctor or someone else medical, they assume the worst. So it's really important to say right off the bat, this is not an emergency. Um, say who you are, I'm the doctor, I'm the nurse. Is this a good time to talk? And then try to get a sense of where they are um, with all of this. How has COVID affected you or your family? And then you'll get the backstory of um, what happened to their loved one over the last week or two, which often we clinicians don't know because we receive the patient without much history. Um, and we often find that other people in the household are also sick um, and may or may not be getting care. So important to find out what the bigger picture is in the family. And then before offering information, ask what the other doctors have said so far. Anyone who's ever been a patient in the hospital or a loved one of a patient knows that people are getting highly contradictory information from different people. 
um, in the hospital. So for example, um, it, the kidney doctor may come in and say, great news, your mom's creatinine has dropped from four to 3.5 the family interprets that as, you know, that the kidney is all better. And that, in, that implies that the patient is getting better. Whereas those of us who know clinical medicine know that a creatinine fall from four to 3.5 is not particularly significant and says nothing about the patient's overall condition or likelihood of recovery. Um, but that kind of cross and miscommunication happens all the time. So very important to start out with what the family already understands. It's very different if a family member says to you, we really don't know what's going on. We took her to the emergency department. They sent us home and we have no idea what happened after that. That You are the first person that we've spoken to. Versus if the family said, well, you know, I spoke to the ICU doc yesterday and he said that mom is on the ventilator and, you know, seems stable but is requiring a lot of oxygen and her kidneys aren't doing so well. These are very different conversations. So very important to find out where the family is in the bigger picture, what their understanding is of what is happening to their loved one, and then ask permission to share an update. And again, we ask permission rather than assuming that people want to know. Some people actually don't want to talk about it um, or prefer that we talk to someone else. Um, and by asking the question, may I share an update with you now, we give the family member that we're talking to control over when the conversation happens, if it happens, and with whom it happens. And that's very important. Not everyone wants to know. Um, and <clears throat> then we share the update, whatever it is we have to say. Um, and what I will do after that usually is say something like, you know, sometimes I'm not very clear when I'm communicating. We uh, doctors and nurses sometimes use a lot of big words that aren't very clear, um, just to make sure that um, I, I was clear in talking to you, could you tell me back uh, what, what you understood from what I just said? Um, and we call that teach back, where you ask the patient or the family to summarize what they understood from what you said. And I don't think anyone on this call will be surprised to know that a good, I don't know, 70% of the time they didn't hear what you said either because the emotion was so high and the anxiety was so high that they couldn't take it in, or because we were unclear or used jargon, um, or because of language difficulties or cognitive difficulties. So assuming that because we said something, it was taken in and understood is a huge mistake. So you have to check. Um, and then in this COVID situation, we try to offer the opportunity to see um, their loved one either by um, smartphone or by tablet, um, and even to talk um, with their loved one um, by smartphone or by tablet. And again, some people want to do that. Other people are afraid or intimidated about seeing a loved one that's on machines and in an ICU. So, <clears throat> Again, you have to ask and not make assumptions. And then just to sort of broaden the lens, those people, and this is the majority of hospitalized people who come in for COVID, the majority survive. Um, they have a very long recovery period. Um, they may be in the hospital, in the ICU for weeks and in the hospital for weeks after that. And then very, very weak and dependent on other people for months thereafter. And one of the big challenges we as a society are facing is how are we going to take care of these people who um, once were independent or needed little or no help and now need help to get through the day. Um, then we also have a large group of people on ventilators who didn't die but also are not strong enough to come off the ventilator. 
And the number of those people has grown exponentially in New York City and I imagine around the rest of the country. And we were already at a deficit in terms of our ability to take care of people that we describe as the chronically critically ill, that is, they don't graduate from ICU level of care, but continue to need it in order to remain alive. And we don't have infrastructure or capacity to take care of those people in the way that they deserve. So for example, in New York City, one of the hospitals in our system that was slated to be closed because we, had too, we thought we had too many beds in New York before this pandemic <coughs> is now being converted into a hospital for people who require long-term ventilator support. Um, so it will be sort of like a hospital a big ICU for people who are chronically dependent on the ventilator. Um, and my guess is that that type of need is going to become prominent across the country as the waves of this pandemic move. <coughs> and clearly people who have been in a bed on a ventilator for weeks or months um, have a very long road to hoe ahead of them. Next slide, please. So this is, this is a, a um, photo of a colleague of mine, Dana Lustbader, in the ICU that she works out at Northwestern, getting ready to, um, <coughs> excuse me, connect a patient with his or her family members through a tablet. And you can see the tablet there is covered in a plastic bag. And on the right, you see um, Dana and uh, the nurse that she's working with uh, connecting first to the family and then holding the tablet or the phone up to the patient's ear so they can talk. Next slide, please. The emergency department was another major demand spot for palliative care and is another major demand spot for palliative care in places where uh, COVID cases are rising. And what initially we thought that we could help these, our colleagues in the ICU by giving them tools, pocket cards, scripts like the one we went through earlier that they could put on their cell phone that they could turn to. And what very quickly became clear is that the people in the ER did not have time to have any conversations with anyone, not patients, not family members. They were just rushing from one critically ill patient to the next, trying to get them the life support they needed, whether it was a ventilator or oxygen um, <coughs> or IV fluids, and then move them on, move them up into the hospital so that they could deal with the next 10 patients that were stacked up, rolling in the door. So we ended up um, actually having to embed palliative care people, doctors, nurses, social workers in the emergency department. And we put them there 24 hours a day, seven days a week <coughs> because, mm. because our colleagues didn't have time to do even the most basic elements of palliative care, symptom management and communication. Um, and the, so this applied in the ERs, in the intensive care units. Um, the palliative care teams often were the ones that held the tablets and understood the technology, had Zoom on the tablet, knew how to connect families to Zoom um, and bring families together with their loved one through the technology. A big part of what we did was really try to understand um, whether the person was still at home, in the ED, or in the hospital, what they really wanted. And sometimes the patients, or often the patients, were too sick to participate in these conversations or too frail or cognitively impaired to participate in these conversations. So they often occurred with family members, um, some of whom were the designated healthcare proxy, some of whom were just family members and the patient had never designated a surrogate decision maker and had never discussed what they might want in situations like this. So we often spent time asking family members, tell us about your mother, what kind of person was she, um, what do you think she would say if she was on the phone with us now about what she might want? Should she get sicker or should she get sick or should she get sicker? 
with this virus. And much of the time people said, she's a fighter, she wants everything, please do everything you can to keep her going. But a substantial minority of the time, people said my mother would never want this. She would never want to be on a breathing machine. She would never want to be in the ICU. I feel guilty that I even brought her to the hospital. She hated hospitals and was afraid of being there. And it was very important to give families a chance to represent, to speak for their loved one who can't speak for themselves. And so these, these, these are difficult conversations, but they were really important to bring the voice and the perspective of the patient, him or herself, into the decision-making process um, and the decision-making process. Next slide, please. Um, so even though there's a lot of press suggesting that everybody who comes into the ICU and on a ventilator doesn't make it, that is not true. Um, a substantial fraction, first of all, 80% of people who get this virus don't even need to come to the hospital. You know, they can weather it at home or in the community and a big chunk are asymptomatic. Um, of those who do need the hospital or end up in the hospital, again, it is a small subset that require ICU care. Of the group that requires ICU care, a lot depends on your age and your pre-existing conditions. Um, in, among people over 80, uh, the mortality rate is much higher than it is among people, for example, in their 60s. But not at all 100%. And a substantial fraction of patients do succeed in coming off the ventilator, being extubated, and leaving the hospital. And as you can imagine, this is a moment of great joy and celebration for the clinical teams that are taking care of these patients. And almost every hospital plays rock music and um, staff do a happy dance. Um, and this is an image of Dana and her colleagues doing their happy extubation dance uh, when one of their patients was able to come off the ventilator. Next slide, please. So what are the sources of suffering? <clears throat> There are many, and I think the biggest one, and this is what's been covered a lot in the press, is at, at critical times of serious illness and life-threatening illness, we all rely on our loved ones and our families. And getting through something like this in complete isolation from those closest to us is really an unprecedented human situation. And the level of immediate suffering and later suffering that will be, be caused by this forced distancing and forced isolation is likely to be large. And for the patients themselves, there's a lot of anxiety and depression already bad enough for being sick, being in the hospital, being scared, but not being around the people who give your life meaning um, and help remind you why life is worth living um, really compounds the problem. Many people with COVID have difficulty breathing, have shortness of breath, which for any of us who have ever experienced that, it is a terrifying feeling of suffocation and a major source of distress and needs to be addressed. If not relieved by oxygen, then needs to, medications need to be used to address that that feeling of drowning. Um, and then one, if people are placed on the ventilator, um, they are pretty much always sedated um, to a fairly high level of deep sleep because it's so uncomfortable being on the machine. And we try to protect people from that experience as best we can. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna pause there. Um, and let you see these, these links, these resources. And what would really be great is if people could talk about what you've been seeing, um, both in your own lives and in those of the people you are trying to help, trying to care for, um, so that me and my team at CAPSI, as well as Kathy and her team, 
at the Family Caregiver Alliance can develop responses that actually will make a difference and will help. So I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Diane, for, um, for that overview. And um, I can't even imagine um, at, at any time going into an ER um, or having uh, ICU, being in the ICU is, um, is very, very stressful and uh, it causes, is, is anxiety provoking. But the impact, the emotional impact on the staff is, I'm glad to see it at Happy Dance. It's, it's really um, quite significant uh, and, um, and tiring. People have, yeah. you know, fatigue. And we talked a little bit about that. How do you, how do you, just as a personal interest, how do the staff, um, you know, how do you take care of the staff as well as take care of the patients? Well, it's, it's very interesting. People who have worked in medical settings, whether clinics or hospitals, know that there's a certain ethos and culture in medicine, which is you never express weakness. You never express need. You just keep going. Some of this is almost like, uh, you know, the military during times of war, you have each other's backs. So if you express weakness, if you stay home to, for a mental health day, you know you are increasing the workload on your friends and colleagues at work. And so people will not do that. The sense of obligation to one another um, is very, very high and sometimes leads frankly, often leads to people working in spite of depression, burnout, exhaustion, mental and physical exhaustion. We do not have a culture that rewards or honors self-care. We have a culture that views self-care as weakness. And even though there's a lot of talk and a lot of hand-waving about people taking time for themselves and meditating and doing yoga and taking advantage of the various uh, support hotlines that every health system has stood up, those all have stigma attached to them. And I, my, my sense is that those of us working in healthcare are less likely than anyone else in our society to take advantage of those things. And I think this is going to be the second pandemic, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, burnout, depression, uh, among nurses and doctors and social workers and others who worked through the surge in the hot spots that the trauma will be deep and lasting. And actually today in the New England Journal of Medicine is an article describing the adverse impact on health professionals as the second pandemic and something that requires strong federal attention and federal action, because if we don't have a workforce, we have no healthcare system. Well, that's certainly understandable. The, the types of procedures that you put in place at uh, Mount Sinai, understanding that CAPSI has a broad number of um, hospital, uh, hospitals that are within sort of the CAPSI learning process, uh, and uh, uh, building uh, a palliative care um, uh, program uh, and understanding throughout the hospital system. Would you, would you say from hearing from your colleagues or that are in other hospital systems, is, this a, is what you're describing a typical um, reaction with other healthcare systems that is to embed the palliative care team into the ER system? that you described? I'm just wondering I, how broad scale that is. I think that um, palliative care was a scarce resource before this pandemic. We were understaffed. Um, many team members were working 70 hours a week. Um, there were high levels of burnout, not only in palliative care staff members, but um, clinicians across all specialties before this pandemic hit. You know, we are a healthcare system that tries to be lean and mean, and the result is real harm to the people working in it. And so some places had the capacity to quickly pivot and set up um, just-in-time resources, 24-7 hotlines um, that served 
both the hospital and community settings, as well as served patients and families at home. And some simply didn't have the staff to be able to do that. Um, in many communities, hospices began setting up um, hotlines as well, um, because hospices didn't have enough personal protective equipment to go into people's homes to deliver non-hospice palliative care to people who are not hospice eligible, but many of my colleagues in hospice did similar things that is making themselves available to their colleagues by telephone to help with symptom management, to help with complex communication and conversations with families. Um, but to say that we were well prepared for this would be dishonest. We were not well prepared for this. And by the way, the Center to Advance Palliative Care does not just serve hospitals. So we have home care agencies, um, group practices, and nursing homes who turn to the Center to Advance Palliative Care for tools and training and technical assistance for their staff. Palliative care is needed in every setting that takes care of vulnerable patients with one or more serious illnesses. If anything, it is needed more in community settings than it is in the hospital because the great majority of people who need palliative care are not in the hospital. They're at home um, and they're in um, assisted living facilities and long-term care facilities and the care they get is in a clinician's office most of the time no matter how hard it is for them to make it to that office so that's where the need is and um, CAPC provides a lot of support to entities that are trying to meet care needs in community settings outside of the hospital. Well, given today, thank you, and I want you to talk a little bit more about um, maybe towards the end about the, 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 the work of, the, of CAPSI. But given that on this call, we have kind of a mixture of some family caregivers, um, definitely some social workers that are uh, in the field that are working with families with um, serious illness concerns and so on. Um, I want to talk about the communication, uh, maybe outside, you know, we talked about it inside the healthcare setting, but outside, um, during this time, how can families better communicate with healthcare professionals at this time? And concomitantly, maybe what can social workers and therapists that are working with families in the community settings, how would you um, advise them to talk about um, communication skills with families? Yeah, so um, first of all, on the link that was on the last slide is the COVID-19 toolkit. And on that toolkit are a series of scripts that in many different situations, talking to a family member whose loved one is at home, talking to a, a family member whose loved one is in a nursing home, talking to a family member whose loved one is in the hospital. Um, and so I would make use of those because they come from the world's experts in these um, complex communication challenges. And those are all free to everybody. Um, everything in the COVID-19 toolkit is free. Um, in terms of how to coach family members to extract information from the hospital, that gets tough. And one of the questions on the chat here was um, about, someone who couldn't, couldn't get any information about her loved one who was in the hospital. Um, there are a couple of, couple of ways to approach that. One way is to, first of all, um, not call 20 times a day because then you get labeled and people start ignoring the calls. The second way is to um, ask for the name of the patient's physician. You're, as a family member, you have a right to know who their doctor is, who the responsible physician is, and leave a message saying you would like to have a conversation with the physician, and here's your number, and uh, you know, here's when you will be available. If you then do not hear from that physician, you call the patient representative office. And pretty much every hospital has a version of a patient representative office why? Precisely for these types of problems, because of sometimes completely inadequate responsiveness to the needs of both patients and families. And the patient rep 
can make things happen. They can track down the doctor. They can directly page that person. They can say, this family has been making every effort to communicate with you and has not been able to get through. I appreciate how busy you are, but we'd really appreciate it if you would call them. And that nudge from the inside often gets the job done. Um, other family members, and this has happened at our hospital, show up in the lobby and refuse to leave until they get communication from um, the clinicians taking care of their loved one. That also has a way of escalating very rapidly um, to the right people. Um, I wish it wasn't necessary to be such a squeaky wheel, but sometimes it is. Um, you know, I don't have a great answer, as particularly in places where the volume of patient care so far exceeds what the institution is accustomed to and is staffed to deliver um, that you literally can't get anyone to answer the phone. And there are those situations as well. We've, um, we have noted that um, for our families that have individuals in extended care, whether assisted living, skilled nursing facility, residential care, you know, on, on through the, the, the types of extended care, that this is a particularly stressful time, mostly mm -hmm. because they can't get information and um, it's problematic um, in getting not only phone calls, but any sort of beautiful, uh, uh, visual communication. Right. Do you have any recommendations? Is it sort of the same along the same lines as someone who ha is, uh, has a, a relative in a hospital situation? In other words, well, we well, wheel. <laughs> yeah. So one of the issues in because we've tried this with the tablet or the smartphone in the nursing home. And of course, the person coming into the room is in a mask and a face guard and gloves and a gown. And often people in long-term care settings may have some vision impairment, may have some hearing impairment, may have some memory impairment. So these people coming into their rooms look like Martians mm -hmm. and it's terrifying. And then they come and hold a device up to their face or to their ear. Um, and many of the residents just push it away and really are overwhelmed by the abnormality of what used to be a comfortable life in the facility. So um, in a situation like that, it may be doing more harm than good to try to force the resident to communicate either with staff or with loved ones um, in a situation like that where a resident is delirious, agitated, confused, um, not able to focus or pay attention. First thing I would do is look for reasons for that. Is that person constipated? Does that person have a UTI? Is that person receiving a new drug that is affecting their mental status? Are we missing a subclinical COVID infection in that person. So first thing to do as one would do under normal circumstances is look for reversible causes of agitation and confusion. Um, if there aren't any, um, then we have to figure out whether to try music or um, massage or other non-pharmacologic methods of helping people relax. Um, I think music is a very underutilized mechanism um, in long-term care facilities, mainly because we don't have enough devices or headphones or ways to play music. Um, but then sometimes you have to use pharmacologic agents to get people to be calm enough to A, receive care, and B, potentially communicate with family members. The problem, again, that we've been facing in the long-term care facility is that they are grossly understaffed and under-resourced. 
And now where you used to have, for example, congregate dining, where one aide could work with four people who were eating dinner all at once, now nobody can come to the congregate dining room. Everyone is alone in their room. So the social support, the warmth, the human interaction that normally occurs um, in a long-term care facility have been taken away, and there are nowhere near enough staff to deploy one person to every resident. So we're compounding the, the risk to mental status and physical health of being old and frail and having multiple medical conditions by the social isolation and social distancing requirements of COVID-19. It's a very, very challenging situation. In my opinion, it's a setting that should be the first priority for resources, the first priority for personal protective equipment, the first priority for universal testing, not only of all residents, but of all staff. It's the staff that are bringing the virus into these facilities because the staff are underpaid, under-supported, under-resourced, and largely live in communities that are COVID hotspots. Um, we, should, we should have put the testing there first because it was so obvious that this was the most vulnerable population in our society. And we still haven't put personal protective equipment or um, access, reliable, massive access to testing in long-term care facilities, but that's what's necessary to keep reduce the pandemic's impact in those facilities. Well, it's my hope that we are um, going to open up you know, hearings and talk about the experiences, particularly in an extended care facilities, since it, this is such a disproportionate amount of um, infection, you know, in terms of the rate of infections. Um, and the care uh, in extended care facilities. So right. it's right. just been... No, it, it, we have to make a lot of loud noise about this in the newspaper, on TV, on social media, because only by driving shame will we get action from policymakers. And so um, we want to help you in any way we can to draw attention to this crisis. Well, that's, that's your, your uh, work on the Hill when you're an aging, health and aging policy fellow, I think, right. is in now. Um, given your many years of experience in this field, what are the issues that you've seen during this pandemic that are, may shape you know, or are, are going to shape how you move forward in the field of palliative care? Um, well, I think the, the biggest shift, again, as necessity is the mother of invention, is the shift away from the assumption that we have to have face-to-face -face care to the recognition that a good percentage of what we deliver can be done by telephone and by screen. Um, we need to make those screens usable for family caregivers, for patients themselves, but there are is technology out there that makes it pretty straightforward. So for example, there's a company called GrandPads, G-R-A-N-D-P-A-D-S, that sets up tablets, iPads, I don't know if they're iPads or some other type of tablet, that are really set up to be straightforward, user-friendly, as low-tech as such a thing can be. And they're being used a lot. Um, among um, not necessarily homebound, but older adults, helping them connect with their own families, um, providing online bridge games and um, bingo games and poker games to keep people engaged and active. So we need to get better at making the technology accessible and usable and in the hands of the most at risk from social isolation. So I think the biggest shift will be recognizing that it is better to deliver slightly suboptimal care than no care at all. Um, and the COVID experience has been very clear that we can do a lot of good by phone and by tablet and um, through telemedicine and that we need to really ratchet that up rapidly so that a patient doesn't have to come to the emergency department to 
um, be assessed. They could be assessed um, if a loved one set up a screen um, and a clinician could look at the patient and ask questions of the patient by screen, things like that. So for, uh, I want to move to the, um, to the questions, uh, and this is a cue for um, uh, Tatiana and Calvin to uh, be getting um, the questions in order uh, to, to ask Diane. But while they're doing that, um, what I'd like you to do is just um, take briefly, just uh, talk a little bit about the resources that CAPSI has on their website that would be useful for families and professionals at this time. Yeah. Um, well, certainly the scripting. And so it's, if you go to capsi.org and look for the COVID-19 toolkit, you'll see everything. And there's a bunch of different um, resources, including setting specific resources. So nursing home is one of the settings, hospital is one of the setting, home care is one of the settings, um, and everything that we can find that we think is high quality um, and accurate, uh, we're pulling together and putting into those settings. I think one of the other things that's really helpful is symptom guidance. One of the things that still remains not taught in medical and nursing schools is how to relieve physical suffering, how to relieve pain, how to relieve shortness of breath, how to relieve agitation and restlessness. Um, basic things like how to treat and prevent constipation. This stuff is, believe it or not, not taught. So many clinicians don't know how to do it. And what we've done is make our courses, our online courses free during this pandemic to anyone. Um, so there's guidance about how to manage constipation, how to manage shortness of breath, how to manage confusion. Um, and we've seen, I don't know, tens of thousands more course completions in the last two months than we normally do because clinicians are realizing how desperately they need this knowledge and this skill and that they don't have it. And so they've been flocking to the training. Um, so the, uh, the, someone asked, what is the website for the resources? It's capc.org. And if we can go back from questions to the prior slide, it'll show the, um, it'll show the links. Yeah. Um, so the, the top link is getpalliativecare.org, which is aimed at the public, um, patients and families, and just interested regular people. It explains what palliative care is and it has a program directory. So you can put your zip code in or your city and state and you'll get a drop down menu of all the palliative care programs that we've been able to identify in your area. The link on the bottom, which is uh, our toolkit of COVID specific resources is again at capsi.org and then you'll see the COVID-19 response resources. If you go to capsi.org, the first thing you'll see is the COVID-19 toolkit. So you'll just click on that. I, um, I, the other thing I'm noticing here is a chat about um, grand pads and bird song life um, as, um, as tablets that have been designed for um, regular people as opposed to millennials. And um, uh, so that's, that's useful information. I'm going to look that up. Okay, so um, uh, Tatiana or, or Calvin, do you want to um, summarize some of the questions that we've been uh, getting? Sure, this is uh, Calvin with Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, good morning, Dr. Meyer. We do have a lot of questions, so I'll get right into it. We have one listener who would like to know, I guess once you have a patient who is sick enough to require a ventilator, but eventually is able to be discharged at home after however many incremental steps, what kind of care needs might this person need and how long might the effects of being on a ventilator and having to recover from a fairly serious bout of uh, COVID-19 entail? You know, this is the $64 question because we don't know. Um, we know that pre-pandemic, 
patients who survive an ICU stay and a ventilator typically are not able to go home again particularly older people. That is, they end up permanently in a long-term care facility. And very often, um, I worry that had they understood beforehand that that was the best possible outcome that we could hope for was life um, permanently in a nursing home that some people might not have opted for that level of treatment. Um, In the case of COVID-19, we just, you know, we're dealing with a fire hose of need and demand and for the most part did not have time to have discussions with people of would they want to be on a ventilator and be in an ICU if the odds were high that it meant not ever returning home again. Um, And my guess is that some people would have opted against that, but there was no chance to have those discussions. So my guess is that it will be similar to other people who have tried to recover from being on a ventilator and being in an intensive care unit for a long period of time. Some people will get rehab and will be able to go back home. Others, other people will get rehab and will not be recover enough to go back home and will require long-term care. And as usual, this is going to break down by social class. Those with money, can pay for help at home. Those, most of us who don't have money will become reliant on Medicaid and end up um, in a nursing facility because our loved ones either are not well enough themselves to provide our care or can't be home 24 seven to take care of us. So we'll see a, a disparity in what happens to people um, after an ICU stay. Thank you. And as a a follow-up, I think I've heard a bit of a, a bit of a theme, but would you recommend that people have these kinds of uh, maybe advanced care planning, some of these discussions about what you might want. Yeah. A certain situation might happen to discuss values and. and, Yeah. So So, great question. I saw it on the chat and um, the way that, I, as a clinician, approach these conversations with my patients, and I have this conversation with all of my patients, no matter how young and healthy they are. So I might be talking about using seatbelts in the car or the need to get the annual flu vaccine or the need to use bicycle helmets when when out riding your bike. And I will say, now I need to talk to you about who you might trust to make medical decisions on your behalf should you lose the ability to make your own decisions. And I say, I discuss this with all my patients. Um, Any one of us could be hit by a truck. I could be hit by a truck walking out of my office here this afternoon. I would want to make sure that someone who knows me and cares about me is the person communicating with my doctors. So I will say, I have appointed my husband to be my healthcare proxy or my decision maker because he knows what, what, A, I I know he has my best interest at heart, and B, he knows what I would want should I be so sick that I wasn't expected to recover. So the first thing I address is the appointment of a legal surrogate decision maker. That is the most important thing, that whoever is taking care of us knows who we want them to talk to when decisions have to be made if we're unable to make our own decisions. The second part of the conversation that I have goes as follows. I will say, I'm not going to ask you about ventilators or other technology. Instead, what I'm going to ask you about is what is an acceptable quality of life for you? And I'll give as an example. The example is someone who was hit by a truck and is had a traumatic brain injury and four months later has not awakened from coma and is not expected to awaken from coma um, and is likely to spend the rest of their life in a nursing home in a persistent vegetative state. So let's imagine that that was your situation. And I'll say in that situation, some of my patients say that they believe in miracles and no matter how bad their quality of life, no matter how 
poor the likelihood is of recovery, they would want everything done to prolong their life, even under that circumstance of being permanently comatose. And I say, but others of my patients say that if that they were no longer able to recognize and interact with their loved ones and were not expected ever to be able to do that in the future, then they would want care only focused on their comfort. They would not want life prolongation under that circumstance. And then I say, which kind of person are you? And what's good about putting it that way is I'm not pressuring them in either direction. I'm offering two options that are equally valid, um, or I'm presenting them as equally valid, and not making people feel embarrassed or guilty if they say, I want everything done, um, but making them feel like there's some people who want that and there's some people who don't want that. Um, and I find that 90% of people say, if I was never going to be awake to interact with or recognize my loved ones, just make me comfortable. But 10% want everything done. Um, and then I write that down. I put that in the medical record so other people can see it. And what I'm then asking the person to do is not make a decision about a ventilator because that doesn't make sense. If you developed a pneumonia that we thought we could get you better from, of course you would want a ventilator. Um, you would only not want a ventilator if it wasn't going to restore you to an acceptable quality of life. So I don't think it's helpful to talk about specific medical interventions. I do think it's helpful to think about what would be a quality of life that's acceptable versus one that is not acceptable. And I will tell you that the majority of my patients feel that living permanently in a nursing home would not be an acceptable quality of life. Now, I know many people who are permanently in a nursing home and have a very good life um, and wouldn't trade it. They feel like they have human support and human connection and pleasures in the, in the day to day. Um, but many of my patients who are living in the community perceive that outcome as a fate worse than death. And I need to know that because it will influence how, if they are not able to make their own decisions, how their family and we, the clinicians, will make decisions in the future. Does that make sense? Thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic, um, very detailed answer with all the, um, the, the practical examples. That's, thank you. I had another question um, related to, I guess, maybe more of the professional side, since, of course, you have been dealing with this whole um, pandemic for so long. Are there any, say, kind of low resource, um, low cost things that some of these um, healthcare providers, emergency room departments or hospitals that they might implement that will have kind of an outsized um, beneficial effect, be it maybe staff mental health or some other maybe smaller things that organizations can implement already right now without having to you know, be looking for, you know, PPE or some other things that might be out of their ability to affect? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I've got about one more minute, but let me say that a um, couple things. One is mandatory days off. I think if you ask people to ask for um, personal time or to say, I need a day off, they won't say it. But I think if the leadership in a facility or a hospital or a clinic says everyone's taking a day off, this is you know, mandatory for the well-being of our staff and our ability to sustain this level of effort, you know, and here's the schedule, then people will do it. And that would make a huge difference. The second thing that's relatively inexpensive to do is to try to improve access to palliative care experts through telemedicine because that way you don't have to dispatch a human being um, to a hospital or a nursing home or a patient's home. A lot of good can be done when you have expertise at the other end of the phone. Um, and I think outreach to try to identify local palliative care capacity using the link that's here on the slide, getpalliativecare.org, and 
seeing if you can identify either local foundations or local payers who would be willing to provide enough support that that palliative care team could deploy a 24-7 availability to the community could be relatively inexpensive and have disproportionately high positive impact. So, Thank you so, so much. So we're uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the program and um, just about out of time. And I wanted to say that um, in reading the question in the Q&A and the chat, um, leads me to believe, Diane, that we need to do another um, session on palliative care and perhaps a look at it from a different angle from families who are really trying to uh, advocate for themselves to receive, you know, to be in palliative care program, to receive right. that kind of care from their own health system and other things that we were not able to get to. Yeah. But I, I, so, so you're gonna, you may be on the hook for another, another session. Sorry I would love to do as many, <laughs> I would love to do as many as you will have me for. So, um, and I would like to be able to be more responsive to the regular people who are on these calls and be very happy to do this. Anytime. But, that's great. I just wanted to mention to um, um, everybody on the line that we have a poll for feedback on this program that will pop up on your screen in just a minute. And we'd love to hear back from you. If there are particular issues that you think that we need to address in a future um, session, please make a note of that. Um, and to remind everyone that this program and additional resources on COVID and caregiving will be posted on the FCA YouTube channel shortly. Give us a few days. We do a little bit of editing and then we put that up. I'd finally like to thank um, Dr. Mayer for sharing her expertise and experiences related to palliative care and practice during this time of COVID-19. I encourage everyone to go to the CAPSI website as there are a wealth of resources there and a number of webinars that are continuing different pieces of this kind of conversation that are um, open to everyone and are scheduled um, pretty much to the balance of this May. So something that you may be interested in you didn't hear today might be covered in one of the upcoming webinars um, that's posted on the CAPSI site. So again, thanks Diane for a wonderful program and thanks to all of you attending today. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.